the uh, meeting is now in order and uh, we're ready to go. So, Dan, I, I don't know how much time uh, you need for your talk, but I don't want to cut you short at all. And we're really anxious to hear from you. This is uh, Italo Balbo at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. So this is Italo Balbo. Um, this, these are all postcards you're going to be seeing. And uh, he was one of the original group, along with Benito Mussolini, who took over Italy in 1922. And uh, Mussolini put him in charge of the Air Force, uh, even though he didn't at the time know how to fly, but he learned how to fly. And he, um, one of the things he did uh, during the 19, late 1920s is he led uh, mass seaplane flights around the Mediterranean. And uh, this was to promote Italy and Mussolini and Italian aviation. And then in 1930, he led a group of 12 uh, seaplanes from Rome to Brazil. And then in 1933, to uh, celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Air Force, actually it was originally going to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Mussolini coming to power, but it took, they were a year late. He let, uh, created the, uh, Crociera Aerea del Desinale, uh, which is the uh, 10th anniversary cruise of the Air Force. And this was a group of 24 planes, seaplanes that went from Rome to the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. It was about one, uh, about 100 crewmen. And of course they flew across the North Atlantic to Chicago. And this is a car just showing uh, some, some of the planes, the crew, and Orbitello, which was the, uh, the, I guess the air base, what you would call it, north of Rome. And this is a postcard that shows the route and was carried on one of the planes from Montreal to Chicago. And you can see the stamp on the right side. And there was some controversy about this because uh, they weren't supposed to carry mail like this. Uh, there was officially uh, sanctioned mail that was um, flown from Chicago back to Rome for which people paid a premium. But as you can see, uh, this was stamped and some people did the research and based on the postmarks, they said it had to be on the planes. So you can see the, uh, th they flew from Rome to Amsterdam, uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland, uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, then uh, Cartwright in uh, Newfoundland, onto uh, Shediac in New Brunswick, Montreal, and Chicago. And uh, here's some uh, postcards of the plane. I just always thought it was a fascinating plane. Uh, basically made out of wood, uh, twin hulls, uh, the crews would sit in the two hulls. There was a little area between the hulls for the, the pilot, uh, about an 80 foot wingspan, uh, 50 feet in length and weighed 12,000 pounds. Oh, and a push-pull engine on top. And here's just, I think, a, a great uh, view of an airplane engine. What, what other uh, airplanes have had uh, pictures taken of their engines like this? Uh, here's a group shot uh, in front of uh, some of the planes before they took off. Uh, here's a double card, bifold card of the planes. And this is from a set of 35 cards, but there are two bifold cards and each card is numbered. So there's actually only 33 cards but they decided to number all of them. And here's how the plane would be put into the water. And for those of you who uh, haven't considered it in the 1930s, um, they didn't have too many airports, which is why seaplanes were so popular. You could always take off and land on the water. And here's uh, Balbo speaking to the crew before they took off. When well, they took off on uh, July 1st is when they left for Amsterdam. 
And I like this card because it shows how few people were there when they took off. And they flew in uh, sets of three planes in formation over the entire uh, route, which would have been uh, about 6,000 miles. And they flew at 125 miles per hour. So this is what it looked like when they took off. This is what it looked like when they returned. It's a very risky flight. So now we're going to go there and see them off. But once they were successful, everyone wanted to be there to greet them, including Mussolini. Uh, here's a card uh, taken of uh, Balbo in uh, Shediac, uh, New Brunswick. And I include this because first of all, it's actually dated for when he was there, July 13th. And on the back, uh, actually, I'm getting confused. There's two cards. This is also from Shadyac. And on the back of this card, it mentions, you can read, this is one of General Balbo's airplanes that was forced to land, meaning into the land, at the Victoria, uh, Prince Edward Island, on its way from Chicago to Newfoundland. When the tide went out, it left the plane high and dry in the sand, much to the surprise of the Italian flyers who had never before seen a tide. The Mediterranean has no tides. Uh, because of how narrow the Strait of Gibraltar is, the Mediterranean does not rise or drop very much. Uh, here's just another nice view of, uh, of the airplanes. So you can see they could uh, work on the engine by climbing up onto the wing. So they took off on July 1st to Amsterdam. Uh, next, uh, the next day, they flew to Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, weather delayed their trip to Iceland until the 5th. Uh, they were delayed in Iceland until the 12th when they got to Newfoundland, uh, then on to Shediac, New Brunswick, Montreal, and finally arrived in Chicago on July 15th. And they were actually in the air for about 500 hours. Now, this is a card of the Italian uh, building at the Chicago World's Fair. It was designed kind of to look like an airplane with the wing in front and the uh, tower resembling a tail. And this was the inside of the pavilion. Uh, Chicago had a population of 300,000 Italian Americans, which is why it was a good destination. Uh, here's a postcard of the planes flying overhead. I believe those wires were for the, uh, the sky ride that they had at the fairgrounds. And here's a ticket for when uh, Balbo appeared at the uh, Soldier's Field. About 100,000 people were there. And as you can see, it's not dated because they really didn't know when he was going to arrive. Hey Dan, yes. Where, um, where did they land those planes? They they just land them in the lake up there at, 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 at Lake Michigan. Yep, yeah. and then they would send out little uh, power boats, little little skiffs to pick them up and bring them ashore. So here's Balbo, as you can see, becoming chief uh, flying eagle at the American Indian villages at the Century of Progress. I wish I knew more about what he did at the Century of Progress, besides uh, getting an Indian headdress. So he, they, uh, they leave Chicago and they fly to uh, Floyd uh, Bennett Airport in New York. Oh, also I should mention in, in Chicago, uh, they, get, they had a parade for him, of course, and 7th Street was renamed Balbo Avenue. That's just 7th Street, there's only a few blocks of it uh, near Lincoln Park and uh, the planetarium. And it, it, it remained unchanged during World War II and it's still Balbo Avenue today. Uh, once in a while, uh, somebody in Chicago will raise the issue as to whether they should continue to have a street named after a fascist, but it's still, Balbo Avenue. So um, July 19th, they fly to New York. Uh, 
he goes down to Balbo, goes to Washington, D.C. on the 20th uh, to have lunch with the FDR, uh, then back to New York, a ticker tape parade, and uh, they leave the United States on July 25th. Um, <clears throat> they still run into some weather issues, but they finally get back to Rome on August 12th. So uh, about six weeks in total. And uh, one of the art forms that was popular in Italy was called Futurism. And uh, future, it started back around 1910, but it liked to emphasize uh, power and uh, speed and uh, machinery. So as you can see, the, uh, the airplane was a perfect uh, uh, subject for that. Uh, these two postcards were designed. Uh, the artist was originally known as Guglielmo Sansoni, but he had a ceremony in which he buried Guglielmo Sansoni and recreated himself as Tato. So you can see his name there, Tato, T-A-T-O. Why? Why did he do that? Uh, he was an artist. <laughs> and uh, here are some postcards uh, that were uh, created by another Italian uh, artist, Umberto de Lazzaro. And one thing that occurred to me in, in looking over this program is that all of these postcards that we're looking at were created after the flight. Uh, there's just that one or few cards from Canada that were printed while he was still in North America, but everything else was after his successful return to Rome. And here's uh, three more cards by De Lazaro. And uh, the card on the left, the green one, uh, they always like to make the comparison between these uh, Balbo and other Italian aviators who crossed the Atlantic and of course, Christopher Columbus. And uh, three other cards. Um, the card in the middle was uh, turned into a poster and huge posters that they made uh, based on this artwork, you know, like four by six foot, four by six feet. Oh, and the, uh, the Roman numeral uh, that you'll see during this period on just about anything Italian uh, equates to how many years since 1922 when Mussolini came to power. So X1 would be 11. And this is a really nice set of uh, cards. Uh, as you can see, they have got the uh, Mussolini and, and the uh, Italian Fascus uh, as part of the design, flying over the Alps to Amsterdam. And then next was uh, leaving Reykjavik for Cartwright. And uh, over the Atlantic. I, I have a jigsaw puzzle that's very similar to this card. And uh, it was a lot of fun trying to put it together with nothing basically but shades of green and blue. Oh, here they are arriving in Chicago. Oh, and it says each of these cards has it in English on Italian and English on the back as to uh, the little caption. And of course he was on Time Magazine. And uh, what happened to uh, Balbo upon his return. He saw the, the big group greeting him. Uh, he's given a parade. Uh, he's promoted. And then a few months later, uh, Mussolini sends him off to be governor of Libya, the Italian colony, uh, <clears throat> because it was a very small spotlight in Rome and Mussolini did not like Balbo getting so much attention. He saw all those beautiful postcards that were printed because of Balbo's successful flight And in 1940, uh, during World War II, as Balbo was returning 
to his Air Force base. Uh, he was mistaken for a British bomber. The British had just attacked the base, so he was shot down by friendly fire and died. Wow. Yeah. Uh, amongst other areas, there was a memorial service held for him at St. Peter and Paul Church in uh, North Beach in San Francisco. And of course, starting in 1963, they started issuing cards on the anniversary of the flight. So you can see the, uh, these are from 63 and 73, the 30th and 40th anniversaries. On the, there's six cards altogether from the 63 uh, set of uh, 30th anniversary cards. And these are just individual cards issued for the 50th and 60th anniversary. Um, the 70th and 80th anniversary and uh, I can say uh, they get harder to find. It was very difficult for me to finally track down the cards in 2013 from the 80th anniversary. And of course, in uh, two years, we'll have the 90th anniversary. And I certainly hope somebody issues some cards. Maybe it'll have to be me. And, and the last card I'm going to show is uh, not from the flight, but it is from 1933. It says so on the back in Italian. And I just love this card. It's just like somebody saw the plane flying overhead and grabbed their camera and took a snapshot. But it is the smallest plane I've ever seen on a postcard in flight. They, they needed a telephoto lens. And that's the end of my program, short and sweet. Wonderful, wonderful. Fabulous. Fabulous. Great. That's a wonderful collection. And you managed to get postcards, a ticket. Uh, you mentioned a jigsaw puzzle and that time cover. Uh, how did you find all these? Because some of them, I don't know how, did you get them online or in shows or what? Um, well, um, okay. Well, I, I was at the 1995 uh, Metropolitan Postcard Show in New York. And there's a dealer there, a very high-end dealer. And it was my birthday as well. So I figured, what the hell, I'm, I'm going all in. And he had a set of 10 of those real photo cards, which I bought. This is, this is before eBay. And I just figured, oh, I'll never see another one of these. You know, I, they're numbered on the back. So I could see at the time there were at least 25 or 30, depending on what the highest number was. But over the years, I managed to, to get them all on eBay, um, sometimes at a, at a show. Um, there are Italian um, or there are European auction sites where I'll sometimes find them, but uh, most of them have been on eBay. There there's a, was a big postcard show that was held in uh, Verona, Italy, that I always dreamt of going to, but never made it. Yeah, um, there's a lot of interest in Balbo um, because uh, aviation in the 19, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, we always think of Lindbergh, he's our hero, but to the Italians, Balbo is their hero. And uh, the Euro Europeans had a tremendous interest in aviation, uh, especially the French, because their aviation goes back uh, shortly at, well, their powered aviation started right after the Wright brothers, but their uh, lighter than air avi aviation goes back into the uh, 18th century. Oh. Very good. I've, I've, been in, I've been in Paris and gone to postcard stores in Paris and asked about aviation and all these show me are French cards. Oh. I'm just... I'm back. You you had, you had mentioned at the beginning of your talk that uh, Balbo uh, didn't even know how to fly when he uh, was he uh, yeah by Mussolini to join the group there. I mean, how did he? I, maybe you don't know the answer, but how did he learn to fly? Number one, and why would Mussolini have chosen a person who to lead the air force who didn't? didn't know how to fly. That seems kind of well, crazy. Well, I think uh, in 1922, Italy did not have much of an air force. Uh -huh. And uh, 
I don't know why he was chosen. Maybe, maybe he volunteered. And uh, it, it's not, I understand it's not hard to fly an airplane. Yeah. You know, um, it's just, you just got to be careful. That's right. Do any of those machines by any chance oh, still exist? Here's, here's, here's another little uh, part of it. So I, I was able to learn that as well as uh, sending Balbo off to uh, Libya to get him out of Italy, Mussolini, all of the planes destroyed. Oh, no. There is uh, one known model of uh, that plane. Uh, it's an earlier model that exists in a museum in Brazil that was flown by a Brazilian uh, from Africa to Brazil back in the 1920s. You know, so he, he did a solo crossing of the Atlantic, but it's a much uh, shorter uh, trip down between Africa and Brazil. But that's the only one I know of which, which existed. Wow. That still exists. What a shame. What a shame. Dan, Dan, do you have a card in front of you that you could show exactly where the pilot sat? Um, well, not in front of me. <laughs> let, let me go get one. Okay. So while he's getting um, a, a something, um, the first, there's some people that debate this, but generally it's recognized as Italy being the first, issuing the first e, uh, airmail stamp. I don't know if you guys knew that. So uh, there's a couple people that say India did the first e airmail, but um, I, I don't know about, I don't believe that. I've always believed it's been um, Italy as well. And it was in 1917. Um, so, you know, it's not like Italy doesn't have aeronautic history. So, um, the other thing was interesting was one of those pictures looks like a place just out of Rome that looks like there's cinema. Um, there's a place called Cine Città, which is the cinema city, which is where their, uh, all their main cinema uh, places are, which later Mussolini set up for, uh, to do his propaganda films and stuff. And it looks a lot like where all those planes were getting set up. Okay. And I want to take a look at that. Here's a view. Uh, you can see the little area under the propeller. That's where the, the pilots would have sat. These planes, they also had a sh short life as passenger planes and putting passengers in the, uh, in the twin hulls. And apparently it would, it would have been possible for a crewman to climb onto the roof of the plane and work on the engine in flight if necessary. <laughs> Jeez, they were right under all the noise. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm <clears throat> I'm I'm not proud of these, but they did issue a lot of postal history. But you know, uh, uh, those those philatelists, you really got to be careful around them. <laughs> You're making Patrick smile. <laughs> they look at the Ask them. a question. Here's, here's, one of ahead, the, uh, here's one of the envelopes that would have been carried on the plane uh, mm. from, from Chicago to Rome. So it has the big oh. stamping in the middle. It had to have somewhere written on it or typed on it from Chicago to Rome, you know, on the Balbo's flight. And you, you paid a little extra to get it done. It looks very messy with all those stamps and things on. I'll give you 50 yeah. cents for it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead, Don. Did, did Balbo have any uh, disagreements with the Mussolini's fascism as part of the reason why he was exiled, more or less? Well, um, you know that? there's always debate about about that, um, I'm not defending Mussolini or fascism, but they weren't really big into the whole anti-Semitic aspect of, uh, of Nazism. 
No, no. Very little history of uh, them, you know, rounding up Jews to be sent off to any camps. But eventually they were by the Nazis, yeah. maybe. Oh, yeah, well, once, yeah, once, once uh, when uh, the Germans occupied Italy, that's yeah. when it began. Uh, but with fascism, Balbo was happy with it. He, I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, he, hey, he, he was. Uh, you don't think so. his being shot down was deliberate? Uh, there's, there's a conspiracy theory concerning that about this, this mysterious submarine that was in the bay. And as soon as he shot down, the submarine goes away. The other question is, uh, he apparently had gone on a flight, a secret mission that nobody knows anything about. Why was he even flying? Yeah, so, uh, that was suspicious. That, that, yeah, that died with him about, about the flight. So he missed the big battle in Libya then. He missed yeah. the battle. He, he was very successful in Libya before the war. He, he uh, did a uh, car races. Mm -hmm. He set up a, a big race course and uh, had a lot of famous uh, drivers come to race their cars there. This is, this is one of those subjects I'm afraid I could put you all to sleep talking about. So I should stop while there's still... Uh, all 50, all 50 airplanes got back safely and the entire crew uh, we started with 25 planes. Uh, one of them actually crashed, uh, I think, in uh, Amsterdam. Huh? They ended up with 24 planes that made it across to uh, Rome, oh. or to Chicago and back. Yeah. Why did, how did they fly over the Alps from Rome, from Rome to uh, Amsterdam? Why didn't they go the easy way up France? Through France, why did they go through the mountains? Well, it's it's their mountains. <laughs> their mountains fly over the Alps. It's more impressive. Well, wasn't that dangerous? So high? I think every part of this flight was was dangerous, but uh, you know, that they, sounds to me to be stupid. Well, they they have been successful with the flights around the Mediterranean and the flight to uh, Brazil. So they probably had a had a good feeling. But they went up to 12 or 14,000 feet over the Alps? They, they must have. Yes. That's strange. And thank you very much, Daniel. That was such a great presentation. I, I think it's interesting to think about 125 miles an hour. You know, they're, they're basically just, you know, making it along, it seems like. Yeah. I remember being in a helicopter once at a low speed like that. It's kind of going yeah. sideways through the air. Yeah, well, not, not, not much faster than a Cessna. Yeah. And not, not much bigger than a Cessna. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That was a, that was a really, and really course, interesting history. They, they had a supply ship that would, you know, be at each of their uh, destinations to resupply them. I was going to ask you, Dan, if I may, just uh, did briefly to get off the subject, but I was curious, we... Uh, you were looking into that Glenn Theater, and uh, I think you found it, but I never heard anything about you actually seeing it. I know that you were planning on going up to Oakland to see. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't gone up to Oakland yet to, uh, to see it. Um, I Once I found out it was in uh, Oakland, and I, I'll get a picture, uh, a little, I should get a, uh, an image and a little article for the next uh, newsletter. That'd be great. Yeah. Really be great. I, I mentioned it to uh, Ed Clausen in the San Francisco Club because he uh, is an expert on all things Oakland. And he said, oh, sure, the Glenn Theater. He's got that card. In fact, his card is shown in the Arcadia book on the theaters of Oakland. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The card itself doesn't say anything about Oakland. Yeah. May I ask another question? Yeah. The regular postcards published for the Chicago Fair, do any of them refer to Balbo or are they only just Italian cards? Um, are there any from the well, fair yeah, the, the, one, the one where he becomes the uh, chief flying eagle, that's that's an American published card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the other one that I showed uh, uh, welcoming him, there's a few like that. 
and mm -hmm. and there is a postcard that I only saw once and uh, wasn't able to purchase. Uh, I think it's for Brinks, you know, and their uh, their armored car service, and it shows an armored car, and there's the Brinks guys carrying bags of money, and overhead are the airplanes. Uh -huh. But it just happened. They just happened to be taking uh, the photo for that postcard the same day as the planes arrived. There, there was no, uh, it was just a coincidence. Huh. I saw that card once and I've never seen it again. There, there are a few Balbo cards I don't have. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got a heck of a collection, that's for sure. And the talk was very interesting. Oh, I, man. you know, other than hearing of the guy way back when, um, I knew absolutely nothing about him, and uh, you enlightened, you. enlightened us all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks I, a lot. Yeah, neither did I. But then I, I discovered him because uh, I used to collect Chicago World's Fair stuff. Yeah. And that's how I discovered Balbo. Great. That's great. You know, what's interesting is uh, in that time period, in, or in the 30s, uh, these, there's a few of these people who are really – Really made it big, and then and it, their their history evolved. So they went into World War II, and you know did something big. And it's just interesting when they were, you know, in the United States. I remember reading about a Japanese destroyer captain, and he was in the United States in the 30s, take you know taking classes. Yeah. And he was very Americanized. And then you know the war came out. Similar story almost. Interesting. Well, I, it, yeah. Well, I think just like. Uh, a kamikaze pilot who who ends up being the guy who destroys Tokyo, <laughs> dressed up in a Godzilla costume. Right, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I'll just mention one other thing. So he he shot down in 1940, and towns all across Rome renamed streets and plazas for him. And I have a whole collection of postcards for Via Italo Balbo or Piazza Italo Balbo. And I don't think any of those exist today. I think after the war, they were all changed. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you know where he, what? Do you know where he's buried at? He's, he's, I believe he's buried uh, near uh, that airport, Orbitello, about 75 miles outside of Rome, the Balbo family plot. His, his son was also with him when he crashed. His son was in the Air Force. And uh, so they died together. And with that happy thought, I'll, I'll end the program because like I said, I keep going. <laughs> Bet you could. <laughs> so he must have been friends with Enzo Ferrari then, right? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I'm, I mean, we didn't get, we weren't that close. <laughs> well, because I say this because you know the story about how they got that logo, because that was the the logo of a Italian um, fighter uh, air airplane, you know, a, a yep. Air Force fighter and. Um, then they asked Enzo to uh, put that on his car for a race. And then he ended up putting, that was on Alfa Romeo when he was racing for Alfa Romeo. And he ended up putting that on his car for uh, right. all his races. And that became the, the image for uh, the Ferrari vehicles. So, um, and he said he set up cars and was all involved with racing yeah. also. So. Uh, yeah, I was, was guessing they, there's got to be a connection too. It, it became part of the the European race car circuit to go to uh, Libya. There might be a connection between that type of wooden plane and, and the spruce goose <laughs> wooden plane, huh? or that type of architecture or building that type of plane. People were doing that a lot. Maybe, maybe that's where uh, Howard got the idea. Right. It's funny to see that he was smoking a cigarette with the fuels and the wood airplane. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, there, there is another um, Francisco di Pinedo, uh, another uh, Italian aviator at the same time. He flew around the world in one of those planes in 1927. And he had landed in, I think it was New Mexico, and they were refueling the plane. And one of the guys, one of the like, teenagers out there who was helping them refuel the plane was smoking a cigarette and threw it into the water. And of course, there had been gas had leaked in onto the water. So the plane uh, caught on fire and burned up. And he stayed in New Mexico until they could get him another continued flight. <laughs> Yeah, when you're refueling an airplane on the water, it should be uh, the smoking lamp is out. Yeah, <laughs> you'd think. <laughs> Patrick, I got to ask you, I've been looking at uh, what you have behind you there. Um, I, I'm guessing I'm guessing it's something that I just can't make out what it is. What is that that you have behind you? It's an advertisement for a Ford. It's an old postcard. Ford oh. postcard advertisement. Oh, cool. Okay. Who's the, who, who's the artist? Shin. What's yeah, the name? Uh, Cobb Shin, is it? I, I don't know the name of the artist. Henry Ford drew that. <laughs> Turn around and look. Uh, well, it's magical because uh, <laughs> I can't see the uh, name of the artist there. Yeah, it says Henry Ford right there. <laughs> uh, uh, not yeah. like uh, 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 not like oh my goodness. Hey, can I, I? I just did some real quick Google search. Enzo Ferrari definitely did know Italo Balbo because they were both in the original meeting with Mussolini in 1919 that established the uh, Italian fascist party. Wow. Oh, wow. Isn't that incredible? I knew, I knew Enzo Ferrari had, had his fingers in that pie, but I didn't know he had him in so early, but he definitely knew Italo Balbo. They were friends. Well, I'll, I'll include that on the pop-up quiz next month. Uh, it, it's incredible, <laughs> incredible. Yeah, that's great, Michael. Great. Wow. <laughs> And I had I had seen at some point some years ago several of those uh, different of the Tato or Tato postcards and you know I was just blown away with them. Yours are the first ones I've seen since then, but they're so artistic and so powerful and so strong. You know, it's just uh, I'd like to have one or two or all of them, but. Uh, Okay. Do you have others besides the two or three that you showed? I have a few. Yeah, I have a yeah. Few. great. I'll show the plane. Yeah. yeah. Futurism was a very popular art form. Uh, it started around 1910. Pretty much it mirrored Cubism in, in France. And in fact, uh, most of the futurists, futurists were in Paris along with the Cubists. I see. They got together. But of course, uh, you know, for the winner goes the spoils, and uh, France won. And yeah. You call it Art Deco? Um, futurism. Futurism, yeah. Two because different Art things. Yeah. It's like Art Deco and Art Nouveau. Yeah. and. Well, that building at the fair there was Art Deco. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. It was wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Just terrific. Well, if we ever meet again in person, I'll, I'll bring some cards. <laughs> but anyway, thanks a million for uh, for tonight, Daniel. And um, we'll be looking forward to seeing everybody next at the next meeting. And unless anybody has anything or would like to say anything, I guess we're uh, pretty much through for tonight.